Greetings, comrades, and welcome back to another episode of the Comrade Cast. This is uh, take number two, as I realized that my mic wasn't turned on. Fortunately, I didn't get too far into the episode before I realized my mistake. But that being said, I do have to admit I am having trouble doing a show today, and the main reason is I'm feeling the uh, the summer content creator blues. For those of you guys who don't know, there are two times of the year when uh, making content just feels shitty, I guess, because there's usually not a lot of people watching YouTube during those times of the year, and those times of the year are January at the very beginning, and then late summer, particularly August, and going into early September. And the main reason, I think, is because people by this time have realized that, oh crap, summer's almost over, and I should probably do something with that summer besides sit around watching YouTube videos. And unfortunately, I'm also having a similar issue as there are things during the summer which uh, I would like to do and get done, and uh, they have yet to be done. So I was almost thinking about skipping a week, but I decided, you know what, let us do a little bit more of a freestyle episode and see where it goes. So if this episode seems a little bit more meandering than usual, I do apologize. I do have one major topic that we're going to talk about. But before we get there, I just want to briefly talk about a couple things from the last episode. The last episode I was hugely proud of personally. Uh, one of the episodes I'm actually the most proud of and I feel like I could show uh, to just about anybody. But when it comes to topics around the philosophy of Zen Buddhism and how they interact with our politics or our understanding of the world or our emotional states as human beings or some sort of hodgepodge of those factors, I could go on forever. And there are a couple things that I really wanted to touch on from the last episode that I forgot to bring into the last episode and remembered them after the fact. One of the things I really want to talk about and I didn't really talk about in the last episode is how Zen Buddhism teaches us to deal with our emotions and uh, tackle our emotion because I think there is so much unhealthy discourse out there from every conceivable corner of the internet, left, right, up, down, libertarian, authoritarian, whatever you want to say, there is just so much unhealthy discourse about the way uh, we should deal with our emotions, how we should project our emotions. And I feel like this happens to hit men and particularly young men who haven't established themselves or haven't really established an identity the most. It's leading to some very unhealthy circumstances and some very unhealthy ways of dealing with the world. So let's move into what I'm talking about here. Let's dive right in here. And I've got a, a still from an anime in the background here. This is from an anime called Vinland Saga. And I'm not going to spoil any of the context here of what's going on if you haven't seen this anime. Although if you have seen it, you might actually be able to figure out where I'm going with this pretty quickly. But just on a side note, Vinland Saga is an incredible anime. It's one of the few animes which I would actually recommend to anybody out there. Even if you're not a fan of anime, I think you would really enjoy this series. And the main reason is it's not only incredibly acted and drawn from both an artistic and emotional perspective, but two, it really doesn't have any of that kind of quirky, weird Japanese anime-ness that inhabits a lot of anime, which I will say is generally an acquired taste. Anyway, Vinland Saga, can't recommend it enough. But let's move on to the actual topic of what I wanted to talk about here. And one of the things I think is incredibly unhealthy about the way that young men particularly are taught to handle their emotions is that they are taught really awful, I think, advice from just about everybody. So let's talk about the kind of way that men have been taught to deal with their emotions that have led to the rise of a lot of these kind of manosphere red pill movements or whatever you want to say. You would say that, that like they would argue that effectively that men have been taught to no longer be stoic with their emotions. They are no longer taught to control their emotions. They're basically just taught to kind of like let it out effectively that they should be able to cry. They should be able to feel, they should be able to experience all the emotions that <laughs> are available to them in the human spectrum. But what they will then say is that this type of 
interaction that this type of kind of emotional freeness runs into issues when displayed in the real world. And particularly for men, even though we have a society which is trying to encourage them to show more emotion, it also at the same time diminishes them and crushes them and belittles them for showing said emotion. And they will say that women in particular do not like men who are driven by their emotions or completely and totally enthralled to their emotions, especially in the way that society is encouraging men to be. So young men are running into a situation where they are simultaneously encouraged and belittled for showing their emotions. And so then the red pill manosphere come in with their own philosophy to deal with this contradiction. And their philosophy is by and large, go back to the way men used to be, to be emotionally shut off, to be emotionally distant, to not engage with your emotions and do your best to try and crush or diminish them in any way, shape or form. And within this philosophy, like we talked about, there is a kernel of truth. There is a core of truth, which is that not just women, but other men too, do not like men who are complete and total slaves to their emotions, that they are unable to control their emotions. They're crying all the time. They're angry all the time. They're this, they're that, they're whatever. And the thing here is that I, I think that people don't like that from women either, right? They don't like women who are completely and totally uh, enthralled and enslaved to their emotions and just do whatever. We don't like that from women either, but just as a society, we tend to tolerate it more um, from them versus from men. Anyway, the point here I'm making is that nobody wants some man who is, like I said, crying all the time who is completely unable to control their emotions. There's a very important core truth in what is being said here. Because just as we are not completely reason-driven creatures, we are not completely emotion-driven creatures either. These are two contradictory elements which do battle inside of us. Letting your emotions overwhelm you and completely run all your decision-making would be just as contradictory and counterintuitive to becoming a cold, calculating robot that uses no emotion whatsoever. So while these red pill people are right in the sense that women and, I would say, society at large do not like men and they do not want men that are completely emotionally driven, they are wrong on the same token where they think that men need to be completely and totally rationally driven think about what they're asking for one second what they are effectively saying and what they're asking for is for a man a real man can have and show no emotions but there's no such thing as a human being with no emotions effectively what they're telling you in order for you to become a man you have to at some point abandon your humanity and this is an impossible task because no one can ever get rid of their emotions. Even sociopaths and psychopaths feel emotion. It's just they only feel it for themselves. They don't feel it for other people around them. It's only their internal emotions that they can understand. What they're recommending you to do and what they're asking you to do is impossible. They're asking you to become no longer human. And obviously this is going to lead to various bad outcomes. Not only is, are you going to struggle and be frustrated by trying to achieve this impossible task, you're going to turn people around you off. And the reason you're going to do that is because, generally speaking, people understand that if a man isn't feeling and isn't expressing any emotions, there is one emotion that we as a society will allow him to express and it's probably the only emotion that he can freely express which is of course anger and this is something i think that women in particular are very very good at picking up on is a man whose only emotion that he will express is anger and that is generally something that they don't like on a side note i this made me think of this one time when I was watching like one of those destiny debates or whatever, and he goes on to the stream, it's like called 
like the angry man stream or like something i can't remember what the hell this guy's uh, name was called it was called like yeah some it was called the angry man angry was literally in the name in any case he's going on about how he is the most emotionless person and because of this he's able to find the truth and rationality of any subject and he is like screaming <laughs> this he's like i am emotionless i have no emotions bro you understand that anger is an emotion right we like this is lost on certain people that they don't understand this that anger is an emotional response anger is not a logical response Anyway, how do we square this circle? Let's bring us back to how, what, what's the actual solution? How do we express our emotions comfortably in a society which doesn't like us to express our emotions? Well, at the same time, understanding the fact that trying to uh, subdue or destroy or diminish our emotions is an impossible task and will only lead us to anger, hatred, and resentment. So what's the solution? Well, to me, the solution is being able to understand when it is appropriate to embrace the moment and embrace that emotion. When the moment calls for a period of anger or sadness or depression or compassion, or love or care to other emotions which generally speaking aren't seen as the ones that men should be projecting out there into the world it's understanding that these emotions exist and it is very appropriate to feel them at certain times and when that time comes you let that emotion come to you and you embrace it and you hold on to it for that moment and you feel it, and you experience it. And then when it's over, you let it go, and you move on. You know, it's true that a woman doesn't want a man who is completely crying in a blubbering mess all the time, but she wants a man who can look at a piece of art and understand the emotion that it elicits and understand and articulate why that piece of art is great, because it makes us feel something in this moment because it elicits a reaction from us and in that way we become understanding of both the sort of logical world and the emotional world as we, we as we become more comfortable with our emotions it allows us to articulate them more reasonably and more rationally to people around us so they too can understand how we're feeling and i came up with this sort of thinking in this idea when I was reading on meditation techniques for Zen Buddhism, because one of the things that is very difficult, of course, when we're meditating or any time of quiet contemplation is to quiet down your mind because a billion things are coming in at once. There's all these crazy thoughts, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them are making you happy, some of them are sad. How do we organize all these thoughts, all these emotions, all these feelings? Well, the way we organize them is by letting them come into our conscious thoughts, say their piece effectively, and then letting them go. And over time, you become more of the passive observer, watching your stream of consciousness sort of flow through the river of your mind. And I think it's very possible for us to do a similar process for our emotions. But one of the things that I've noticed that as I've been trying to do this is more so than being the passive observer of my emotions is I'm becoming more the shepherd of them in the sense that I can direct them more, put them in their pen or whatever, and then let them out to graze. And you, you understand what I'm saying, right? I have more control than just passively letting them go by. So I guess that's my message that, well, you can never completely destroy or diminish or subdue your emotions. You can become the shepherd of them and understand at which points you need to let your sheep come out and graze, so to speak. And the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is when we talked about the idea of examining ourselves and examining our inner thoughts, and as Alan Watts said, peeling back that onion and seeing the layers and realizing that 
everything that we put on top of ourselves is effectively a social veneer. One of the things I can't believe I forgot to say this in the episode is something that I encourage everybody to do is do the same thing with your political beliefs to examine them, to turn them over, to understand why you espouse the things that you do and why you believe the things that you do and understanding, is this something that I actually believe or am I saying this to try and, you know, look good among my peers or to try and gain brownie points or whatever else? Or is this something that is meaningful to me? Is this something that is actually worth fighting for? And through this process, me personally, I have very much so streamlined a lot of my own political beliefs and shed some of the more unnecessary ones. Although no matter how much I do this process, I always find myself coming back to, at some point, far left and particularly socialist leaning beliefs. And the more I think about it, the deeper I go with those thoughts, it seems that a lot of those things are just for whatever reason confirmed within me time and time again. And on that note, I do want to transition to what is the main topic of the episode today which is I want to do a little global review. And this is going to be very quick. And I actually mean pretty quick. I'm not going to go into super detail about a lot of these things, but a global review of the status of left-wing political movements and the left in various places across the globe. Where is the left strong? Where is it weak? Where are there sources of optimism? Where are there sources of pessimism? I'm going to try and be as... Uh, objective and thorough as I possibly can. But at this point, you guys know uh, my biases and I will do my best to articulate them uh, when they do come into view. All right. So we'll start with my stomping grounds, the uh, continent of North America. One of the things I do want to remind people, of course, before I begin this is where I stand politically. People need to understand that, yes, I am a left-leaning person, but I'm socialist left. I'm anti-establishment left. There is, and particularly people on the right get socialists and liberals confused all the time. They mix them up all the time. They're two very distinct political ideologies. And while socialists and liberals will work together on a variety, will work together on a variety of issues to get our political goals achieved, there are also very many issues which we are opposed to one another. But generally speaking, socialists and liberals can band together to overcome conservatives. But once the conservatives are no longer politically viable, at that point, it's all bets are off. Anyway, the point of me saying this is that there are a lot of parties that are left-leaning, which I don't like hugely. For example, our Liberal Party here in Canada, very much not a fan of them. The Democratic Party in the United States, I generally am not a fan of. The only thing is that they are significantly better than the Republicans who, yeah, they just suck. There's, there's no other way to say it. But I would never consider the Democratic Party my preferred political establishment or my preferred political vehicle. With that out of the way, let's begin, and we'll talk about Canada first. And the thing about Canada is that, of course, we have a liberal prime minister right now, and everybody hates his guts, including me, because he's been in power for close to a decade now. He is extremely narcissistic, he's extremely elitist, he's extremely entitled, and he doesn't really seem to give a shit about average people at all. The thing that really sucks about Canada is that our country is basically beholden to a handful of oligopic business interests, which of course control our government. These interests are, for example, the telecom industry, extremely powerful in this country. There are three big telecom provider, excuse me. There are three big telecom providers in Canada, and all of them effectively collude, collude together with one another to screw us all over. It's one of the reasons we have some of the highest internet and cell phone bills on the planet. But of course, it makes these companies hugely rich, and then they dump a bunch of that money into the 
uh, liberals and conservatives. And of course, they're not the only interest here in this country doing it. One of them is, for example, dairy farmers is another big one that people talk about a lot because dairy farming in Canada is protected. For example, dairy coming over from the United States is taxed heavily in comparison to Canadian dairy. Um, because if we let <laughs> American farmers uh, flood the Canadian market with all their cheeses, Canadian farmers would be destroyed, basically. Of course, there's also out here in Alberta, the oil lobby, which dumps predominantly, of course, into the Conservative Party, tons and tons of money. But yeah, point here being in this country is that right or left, generally the government is controlled by a very small collection of business interests. Overall, in my country, I think that the left is on the downswing. I should have come up with some sort of system here. I got my, my little arrows here. But yeah, sad. I don't really have a sad face. I don't know why he looks angry. Well, I guess he's angry about the predicament he's in. Uh, in, in any case, yeah, I'm not very optimistic for the way the left is headed in Canada. I think that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party are going to rightly lose this next election. And they're going to lose it not because Pierre Polyevra is some great politician with a bunch of great and wonderful policies. He's going to be a primary beneficiary of good timing. But moving on to the United States, where I actually see good things for the left and the left really here being more neoliberal establishment left rather than actual populist left, socialist left. But that being said, one of the things in the United States, and of course is one of the things that um, I'm sure plenty of people will disagree with this assessment, is that the Republicans have really ran themselves off a cliff with Donald Trump and particularly tying themselves to a lot of his more eccentric personality quirks and policies. And of course, when you add into the mix things like the reignition of the abortion debate in the United States, it has really marginalized a lot of conservative elements within the United States. And one of the things people have to remember is that in the United States, conservatives are more conservative they are than they are in the rest of the world. And liberals and left-leaning people are less left-leaning than they are in other parts of the world. And the thing is, if you had asked me eight years ago what my thoughts would be on the trajectory of left-wing politics in the United States, I would have been extraordinarily pessimistic because I felt that at this point I would have been feeling that conservatives had figured out what their political formula to success is. And like I've talked about this before, I think that they do have a formula for political success and they are drifting further and further away from it every day, at least in the United States, not so much, I think, in uh, the rest of the world. Although if the rest of the world is intent on importing some of the United States uh, cultural policies, um, those right wing parties might be in for a rude awakening. I think after 2016 and the victory of Donald Trump, a lot of conservatives were very emboldened and they thought this is our time. We're taking the moment. And a lot of them still feel that way. They still haven't really gotten over the euphoria of those years. And they really haven't come to terms with the fact that the political landscape has changed and things aren't like they were back then. But the confidence they gained from the victory of Donald Trump really let them decide, okay, you know what? We're going to let our freak flag fly. <laughs> We're going to let all this crazy crap come out because it seems like people are actually agreeing with us more than we thought they did. And well, much to my delight, since that time, the conservatives have very grossly miscalculated and I think are well on their way, particularly the Republican Party is well on its way to political marginalization. That is, unless, of course, they can fix their crippling addiction to Donald Trump. Because one of the things I've seen from a lot of the conservative candidates who are opposing Donald Trump right now is they are saying that there is no reason that we shouldn't be very competitive with Biden right now because he's not well liked. He does not have a lot of popular support. So we should be way better poised than we are now. And the reason we aren't better poised than we are now is because we're, we are stuck with a base who is obsessed with Donald Trump. 
And here's the thing, those guys are 100% right. Biden sucks, he is very vulnerable, and if the Republicans could field a candidate who wasn't named Donald Trump, they would have an extremely strong chance at getting the White House in uh, 2024. However, as we've talked about, I still think, and we just had the Georgia indictments come out today, that is now the fourth, excuse me, that is now the fourth indictment for Donald Trump. Very briefly, the first one was the Stormy Daniels thing. And I remember at the time I said, this is really small potatoes, but I think this is to open the floodgates. That seems to be what happened. The next is the classified documents that he kept at the Mor-a-Lago uh, resort. And then the third one is for his role in inciting the January 6th riots. And then fourth is now just today. This is for conspiring to overthrow an election, conspiring to actively overturn the result of a democratically elected process. One thing you will see a lot of people on the right talk about is they are saying that they are indicting Trump just because he called uh, into question the legitimacy of the election. That is not what is happening right now. They are indicting him saying he actively tried to overthrow it, not just he talked about it. And of course, we'll have to see the evidence as it comes out if they have enough evidence to prove that. But I don't think Donald Trump is very good in hiding evidence. So I do think that the prosecutors in this case probably have a lot of ammo to work with. Anyway, unless something happens and somehow these indictments are actually able to bring him down before the election, which I don't know, I don't think that will. I, I, I still think that he will be able to run in 2024 and win the Republican nomination. I don't think he's going to win the general election. But after Trump goes, one way or another, the Republicans and the conservatives in the United States are going to have to ask themselves some very difficult questions of where do they go from here? And I think that there is no easy answers for them. And we talked about that on a couple episodes ago where we went through a lot of the disparate positions on the right and how right now those two camps are united under their fervent ad adoration of Donald Trump. But once he goes, there's a lot of questions, what is going to happen to the party? And in this sense, I think in the United States, the left is much better poised moving into the future. If Republicans could get over Donald Trump and get their shit together, they still do have a lot of political power. But until that point happens, I think that they are going to be set for a little bit of wandering in the wilderness. So I think in the United States, I have optimism. I actually have optimism for this country, for left-wing movements in the United States. So we're going to do a yay, a happy face. There he is. He's happy. Okay. <laughs> let's move to, let's move south. Whoops. So let's move into South America. South America, a continent which gets a rap for not a lot going on, but there's always a lot of political activity in this region. A lot of revolutions, people fighting each other, people grappling for what they really believe in. Lots of stuff happens here. It just doesn't seem to really explode into other countries fighting themselves. It happens more internally. South America as a whole, and there's, there's definitely a lot more countries which I am more familiar with than others. For example, Mexico is a country which I do think does have a strong future for left-wing politics. Right now, they do have a left-wing leader, and uh, he appears to be doing well in the country. Uh, the country, I think, is poised for a strong future. I think Mexico is one of the countries out there that probably has the best outlook moving into the 20, 30 years in the future. The only thing they need to get a handle on is the cartel problem. And I do think that eventually this problem will be solved. It's not going to go on forever. And as soon as it gets resolved, Mexico is going to basically be a place which has a huge number of positives and benefits and not as many drawbacks. So while I don't know what future is in store for Mexican politics, I do think for the left in that region... Things look good, provided that the current president doesn't really shit the bed <laughs> or anything like that. Yay, happy in Mexico. I do think in terms of Central America itself, again, I'm not a big expert in a lot of these countries, 
I do know that there have been some particularly disastrous left-wing governments in various Central American states. So overall, I do think that I can probably say that in Central America, things aren't looking as good. And then moving into South America itself, it's a mixed bag. Of course, you have Venezuela, which is on the upswing in comparison to where it was five years ago. But that's like saying we're in the upswing now that the majority of the zombie apocalypse is over type of thing. This is not a huge jump in living standards or anything like that. Things aren't exactly the best there. But that being said, they are on an upward trend. I also do foresee Venezuelan oil really driving another boom in the country. I don't think the world can go without Venezuelan oil. I think it's going to become a key component, particularly to American strategy, American energy strategy in the future. The only big thing is I don't think that the current left-wing socialist government will survive to see that oil boom. I think that they will be replaced probably within the five, next five to 10 years with a more right-leaning government. So yeah, in that country, I'm not really enthusiastic about left-wing politics. But what's interesting is you go to its neighbor right next door, Colombia, and I have the exact opposite feeling. Not only do I have very optimistic feelings about Colombia in general, this is a country which has been rising very fast in, in terms of economic growth, in terms of cultural impact. Um, this used to be a country that obviously people associated with high amounts of crime, cocaine, obviously all that good stuff coming out of Colombia. And while, of course, that still does exist, the current government has done a lot in terms of cracking down, particularly in urban areas, making Colombia much safer for tourism and a much more friendly international facing country than it was 10 years ago. And of course, you had the recent election of a left-wing leader in the country for the first time, I believe, ever. And one of the reasons why this is the first time ever is because the guy who won, his party was outlawed effectively, uh, so not able to run in elections. And because of this, they sought to get political power through means outside of the political system, generally through guerrilla warfare and that sort of thing. What happened is that these two sides fighting each other came to a deal. And one of the things that the left-wing leaders and the left-wing political movement wanted was amnesty for what had happened during the war. And then, of course, to be able to run in elections. They were granted this. And in the first election that they ran in, they won. So that can tell you maybe why the people in power banned their involvement in politics for so long. In any case, Colombia is a country that I, again, both think left-wing politics has a bright future, and I think the country in general has a very bright future. I think things are really looking up for them. I think that they are going to be quickly become one of the jewels of South America, and it is a country that maybe in a couple of years I can hopefully visit. That would be lovely. In any case, let's move on to Brazil another country which I have mostly high hopes for left-wing politics, considering we just got Lula in, defeating a right-wing populist, although it was a lot closer than I would like. That being said, Brazil still has very deep political divisions in the country, not to mention they have deep economic and geological divisions in the country. It's not an easy country to knit together. They have a lot of things driving them apart, so I do think uh, Lula is going to face a series of challenges in governing the country, but overall I am optimistic for them. So when it comes to the rest of these countries in South America, I am not going to spend too much time talking about them or pretending that I know a lot about them because I am not an expert. I don't know much about what's happening in Chile or Argentina or Peru. Unfortunately, we'll just have to leave it there and we'll move on to across the pond. Let's move on to Europe and we'll talk a bit about Europe because I do think we can talk right now. Europe, I see, is divided into a couple of different blocks 
and we'll go over them. We'll start the first block, which is like the United Kingdom block, obviously now separate from the rest of continental Europe, thanks to Brexit. And because of that, and the various disasters that the Conservative Party have wrought on that country over the last 10 years, I do think left-wing politics is finally looking good in Britain for the first time in a while. I, I can't that if if somehow Kiyosama loses this election, I, he may as well just fucking end it, put a bullet in his brain, because you, there's no... It would be extremely difficult to lose this election given the position that he's in right now and given the various elections that have happened recently. They had a, a, big, a big series of councillor elections, which ended in a very good series of victories for Labour. Polling's looking good. By-elections are looking good. The only thing that's not looking good, in my opinion, is Kia Stammer himself. I know that I'm going to get some backlash when I say that I, I miss Jeremy Corbyn. I liked Jeremy Corbyn. I know he had the worst foreign policy imaginable. Genuinely the worst. Totally toxic. Completely making him unelectable. Terrible, terrible, terrible foreign policy. I understand that, but I do miss, like, when it came to his domestic policy, it was gold. And when it came to having a politician that I felt actually gave a shit about people, he was one of the few. I don't think Kiyostama gives a shit about anybody, to be quite honest. And in his leadership, he has lurched the Labour Party significantly to the right, much to my dismay. It's quite a backlash going from the most left-wing Labour Party in my lifetime to, well, maybe not the most right-wing. I think Blair is still probably more right-wing than, than Kia, but... It's, it's not looking good. And the issue is, just like our conservative leader here in Canada, Pierre Polyevra, if Kiyostama wins in the upcoming election, which seems very likely, it won't be because he's an excellent politician with wonderful policies. It will be because he was the beneficiary of excellent timing. Let's move on to the next big block, which I'm going to call Western Europe. Western continental Europe, that is. Because if we were to go through every single European country, we would be here forever. Yeah. That'll be our Western continental Europe block, and we'll evaluate this as a whole. And in this particular block, I am pessimistic about left-wing politics. The reason being because in a lot of these continental European countries, they have been led by parties which at least propose to be socialist or mainly we're talking social democrats here right so not like actual socialists but slightly more left-leaning democrats either way in many of these countries these parties have really bungled their mandates and it has left i think a lot of particularly younger european people on the continent moving rightward and one of the things we saw this was recently in Italy with the recent election of a far-right government there. And one of the things that drove that victory was young people leaning more right-wing than you would expect. So you'll hear conservatives make a lot of hullabaloo about younger people moving right. In the overwhelming majority of circumstances, that's a load of BS. However, I do think in continental Europe, in Western Europe, that is definitely happening. And moving on to the other block, which is obviously going to be Eastern Europe. But when it comes to this sort of Eastern European block, I do think that there isn't much in terms of wanting to be optimistic about. I think a lot of these countries are still reeling from the fact that they used to be members of the Warsaw Pact, and as a result, aren't enthusiastic about a lot of uh, socialist or communist leaning or left-leaning ideas in general. Uh, many of these countries are very excited to express their national identities for the first time in a long time, and it's hard to blame them for that. Even, for example, a country like Russia seems very enthusiastic to express its ethnic identity, even though it was the primary ethnic identity of the Soviet Union for a century. 
So yeah, I see this is like a very bad place, I think, for left-leaning politics. I'm going to put two sads, two, two down. He's like really sad. Look at how sad he is. His mouth doesn't even look human. Overall, not super enthusiastic about where things are going for left-wing politics in Europe in general and moving into another place, which I'm also not enthusiastic about. It's going to be the Middle East. We talked a lot in our episode about the Turkish election, how in the Middle East, these governments almost uh, exclusively tend to lean right. We have countries which are, in some cases, absolute monarchies being ruled over by theocratic dictators. So not a lot of room for left-wing politics. Yeah, not, not so much hope here, to be honest. I think that there is almost no region which I would find a lot of hope for. If Erdogan had gone down in Turkey, I would have a lot more hope. But unfortunately, he was whoops, able to cling on. But there may be hope once Erdogan goes, where Turkish politics will go after that. I can also see some sort of left-wing backlash happening in the future in a country like Iran. I can see the young people there being tired of being forced to live under religious theocracy. And as a result, they spur some sort of much more left-leaning and progressive type of revolution in the future. I don't think this is going to happen right now or tomorrow. This is like a five, 10 years down the road thing. So I do think that that can happen. But <laughs> until that point, I, I'm not going to really be optimistic about something which could happen, but might not. So not a lot of hope there. We're going to look at Africa and I'll be completely 100% honest with you guys. I, I feel like I'm not in a position that I can comment on just about any of these countries on this continent. Part of me wishes that before I'd actually gone and done this episode, looking back, I wish I had asked one of our mods on the Discord for some advice. Shout out to Yaza. She is very, very fluent and very, very passionate about African politics, particularly about revolutionary African movements. And yeah, I should have asked her. She would have definitely given me a lot of good advice for something like this. But unfortunately, I don't feel like I can really add anything. So we're going to move on. So we're going to move on to Asia. Asia is another region, again, which I have more pessimism uh, than optimism. Uh, when it comes to, like, we, you look at China, China is basically a country that is communist in name only. When it comes to actual, like, communist philosophy and projects and ideology, the only thing that they still do that really comes to mind is they do a lot of regional redistribution, right? This isn't even, we're not even talking about redistribution on an actual individual level. We're talking redistribution among provinces. So what the Chinese government does a lot is they'll take money from richer urbanized trading provinces, areas like Shanghai, Beijing, major economic centers, they will take money from there and they will redistribute it to other less prosperous areas of China and give lots of grants to the various provincial and local authorities there to build up infrastructure as they see fit. But as I mentioned, a lot of that doesn't even get to the actual citizens. This is just like intergovernmental transfers. So it's not, it's not even going to the right places. But that being said, I think China is a country which has a grim future in general. I don't think the CCP is going to survive much longer. And I don't honestly know what will come out of China when the CCP falls. And because of that, I'm going to put a little, whoops, let's put a little question mark here. When it comes to India, India was a country which I would have said even recently that there is not a lot of hope here. However, there is more hope uh, than I previously thought because what has happened, particularly since we last talked about India and we last did our little report card on the country, is that all of the opposition parties have essentially banded together into one mega party <laughs> called the India Party. 
in opposition to Modi and his Hindu Nationalist Party. Seeing this and seeing uh, that these people are banding together in opposition to Modi is giving me a lot of hope for left-wing politics in India in the future. Because I, when we did that episode, I was really worried that India was backsliding into almost a authoritarian type of regime where you would have in something similar to Hungary, where you have free but not fair elections and the party in charge can do what is, I like to call democratic crotch stuffing and inflate the actual amount of balance that they have and support that they have. And they can do this by usually suppressing uh, opposition voices. But if the opposition is able to actually see things going in a bad direction and band together to stop Modi, again, that does give me a lot of hope. So I'll put a very, very tepid, very tiny, <laughs> tiny, very tiny little ray of hope in India. And that hope may be crushed if Modi does go on to win the next election. In that case, we shall see. The other country, which is like, who the hell knows what's going on, is Thailand. They re basically recently had a... Whoops, fuck. Whatever. It, you guys know what used to be there. Another country, which I have no idea what the fuck is happening, is Thailand. This country <laughs> recently had a more progressive prime minister elected, but it looks like the king and military are going to be in like, eh, we don't like this guy, so we're going to say you don't have the power. And it looks like things are headed for kind of a real rough time in Thailand. I like to think that this prime minister represented a more youthful, progressive, and of course, leftward facing political movement for Thailand. But if you can't get out of the gate, well, what are we going to do then? Um, when it comes to moving into countries like Indonesia, I can't really speak too much about, or Malaysia, I can't speak too much about. Philippines, I can't speak too much about either. When it comes to South Korea and Japan, though, I have, again, not much hope. Japan itself basically is a one-party state anyway. Unfortunately, the right wing in Japan has really managed to organize the political system where they can effectively rule forever with only 35% of the vote because Japanese uh, left-wing political opposition is extremely divided and has been divided virtually ever since the country became a democracy after World War II. And again, I, I just don't see things happening and changing in Japan as someone who is obviously a Japophile and has been studying the country and history and culture for a long time. Uh, one thing I can tell you about uh, Japan is that they are very, and the people are very resistant to change. And the only time uh, that change really happens is when something or some force from the outside basically forces them to change or their internal system becomes so backwards and decrepit and inefficient that they effectively have no choice but to change. And I don't think that that change is really happening anytime soon political attitude in Japan right now is very, particularly among young people, it's very, very thick malaise. There you go. There's a very thick malaise among the young people in Japan, and they don't seem particularly enthusiastic about the future of the country and are not really excited about changing it. And when it comes to South Korea, South Korea, again, I, I, they are a country which could go either way. My big worry about South Korea, South Korea is its demographics. It has worse demographics than Japan. They are really headed for a rough time in the next five to 10 years. This has the potential to drive politics in either a leftward or rightward direction. It's one of those things that you can't really say until the time comes. So we'll end off looking at Australia and New Zealand. We actually managed to cover the entire world in a relatively timely fashion. But then again, I skipped over a lot. <laughs> but yeah, it was this exercise in itself is fun and enjoyable for me. Hopefully you guys found it interesting as well. But Australia itself is a country, again, I have high hopes for uh, left-wing politics. Again, we just had the Labour Party elected there after a very long stint of the they have actually their liberal party is a very right-wing party so their right-wing party just recently was defeated 
and things are looking good for that country in general. Honestly, Australia is another country which I have pretty high hopes for. I think it's a bright future in general, well-placed, lots of resources, a very developed country with friendly people. They're getting their culture out there. My little daughter fucking loves Bluey. She's obsessed with that Australian dog. So Australian culture is getting exported out there. And again, I think that it's a country that has, I have a lot of high hopes for. And speaking of a country with a lot of high hopes for, it's neighboring New Zealand, I also think is in a good position as well. Not as good as Australia, just because it doesn't really have the natural resources that Australia has, obviously being considerably smaller. But that being said, uh, it has a lot of the same types of benefits, lots of infrastructure, well-developed country, intelligent population, friendly place a lot of people want to go to. But in terms of left-wing politics, I, I do generally have hope for this country. I know they just had their prime minister, who happened to be a pretty well-known left-wing figure, resign recently. It was a very weird resignation. It was a very weird resignation. I, I don't think that that will hurt left-wing politics in the country moving into the future. And with that, we actually covered the whole world. And this took more time than I thought it was going to. So for some reason in my head, I thought it was going to be shorter. So looking at a recording time, we're actually way over time and I'm way longer than I'd like to be. So with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. I would have liked to have done a feel good story, but if we're going to do a feel good story, we're just going to go into more time. And unfortunately, that's something I can't spare right now. Like I said, unfortunately, I know I missed a lot of countries. Like I didn't really go over Central Asia, parts of the Middle East, <laughs> I ignored the whole continent of Africa. But either way, I thought this would be an interesting kind of exercise to do with you guys, go over the world talk about the state of left-wing politics generally, where things are going, where there's uh, signs of hope, where there's signs of pessimism. And uh, with that, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Comrade Cast. And until next time, this has been the Comrade signing off for now. You guys take care. <laughs>